LT, if you had to describe Marty Ball to somebody who had no idea what that term meant, how would you describe it? I would say power. I would say power, you know, because that was Marty's favorite play. And that essentially means coming off the football, running the football with physical, a physical nature and wearing your opponent down. That's, that's, you know, that's essentially what it is. Um, it's going to be a 60 minute, maybe even longer game, but the objective is to wear your opponent down. And a lot of times you do that by doing the same play over and over again throughout the course of a game. And that, that play is called power. After being selected fifth overall in the 2001 NFL Draft, LaDainian Tomlinson was now the face of a franchise. The Chargers didn't select him that high to sit and learn as a rookie. They expected him to become a difference maker immediately, and he was. With 1,000 rush yards and double-digit scores, his first eight seasons in the league. A big reason for that statistical dominance? His head coach for a chunk of those years, Marty Schottenheimer. The former linebacker had developed a reputation for coaching hard-nosed physical teams, a ground-and-pound, run-first style aptly nicknamed Marty Ball. In this episode, we'll show you how this perfect pairing of scheme and star took Tomlinson from an impressive rookie to a Hall of Famer. We'll also explore LT's relationship with the heart and soul of the Bolts during his early years in the NFL, linebacker Junior Seau, and how Junior passed the torch to Tomlinson as the face of Chargers football. For Haley Elwood, I'm Chris Harey. This is Running for History, Episode 3, Marty Ball, presented by Lazy Dog. San Diego Chargers select Ladanian Tomlinson. Touchdown, LT! Ladanian Tomlinson, one step closer to football immortality. And the handoff to Tomlinson, and he will gallop into the end zone. Charger fans are witnesses to history. Hey everybody, Lazy Dog Restaurants is spreading holiday cheer with these fun DIY gingerbread house kits to take home. It's fun because they've partnered with Habitat for Humanity. 100% of the net proceeds from gingerbread houses sold will help build homes in our community. The kits come with everything you need, from icing to gumdrops and lots of other candies to build the best looking house. I can't wait to make mine with my friends and family. Head over to Lazy Dog to pick one up, and you can see what it's all about at LazyDogRestaurants.com. For all NFL players, their first game is something they'll never forget. It was no different for LT. Well, I remember it being against Washington, and I remember legendary Marty Schottenheimer being on the other sideline. Um, but also, you know, I remember it, it that day was uh, – I thought it would be special, to be honest with you. It was a nice sunny day in San Diego, beautiful, uh, you know, family coming to the game to watch me play for the first time. But I do remember thinking, I haven't had much training camp. I didn't, I, I, you know, I healed out most of the training camp. I played in the last preseason game and I played one series. So I didn't have much time. To get 36 carries, I was pretty tired after the game, to say the least. But it was a great win. You know, it really was an electric atmosphere. And, you know, I was inspired by, obviously, the way Junior led us that day. You know, we were, you know, it was the first game. It was electric inside Qualcomm. Junior say I coming out the tunnel. I mean, I, it was nothing like I have ever seen. And it was a, a great day, obviously, uh, for the Chargers as we won that game. Tomlinson and the Chargers defeated Washington and head coach Marty Schottenheimer 30-3. to The stat sheet caught the eye of team owner Dean Spanos. As for Tomlinson, he couldn't help but take notice of the play style of Washington's offense. Well, I listen, I was excited just to win, okay? But uh, when you look back the next day on Monday and you start looking at what LT did that day, you know, um, the light sort of went off and you said, this guy's really going to be good. You know, didn't know how good at the time, but the rest was history. He just kept getting better and better and better, obviously. And they ran power over and over with Steven Davis, you know, and it was kind of one of those things that I was looking at an offense that I was familiar with even at that time, you know, and we, because we were running the same offense. We had North Turner as our offense coordinator. So we was essentially running the same offense. 
as Marty. Um, but you know, it, it, you know, it, it really was, I guess, telling that I ended up being in the same type of offense, you know, from my very first career game to most of my career, Chris, when you think about it, I played in the same offense. Doug Flutie started under center for the Chargers in 2001, and he was there opening day for each of Tomlinson's 36 carries. The day of the guy carrying the ball 30-something times is, is in the past. It's just, you know, longevity, situational football, spreading people out. But they get better as the game goes. It's like they get a feel. The offensive line takes pride in we're blowing people off the ball, develop the ball, let's go, let's get, run the ball, run the ball. And defenses hate it because that's something they can't stop. Like if you're controlling the line of scrimmage and handling the ball and he's making people, even when they have a good defense for it and someone's free, a runner like LT is still going to get four or five yards by making the first guy miss and getting back in the hole, doing whatever. Um, that's so frustrating because the methodical 13, 15 play drives to a defense wears them out and they can't do anything about it. Flutie was towards the end of his NFL career when LT entered the league. What he saw in Tomlinson was a throwback, the kind of player that reminded Flutie of a former Hall of Fame teammate and Tomlinson's childhood idol, Walter Payton. And I see all these same qualities that I saw in Walter. He could throw the football, he could catch the football, he could run routes, he was an amazing runner. He studied the game and knew his pass protections right away. And um, it was like a changing of the guards for me, That I think more than anything, because Walter was towards the end of his career and I was a rookie. And then I was at the end of my career when, when LT was the rookie and I can see you know what he's gonna have ahead of him. So it, it was kind of a cool comparison. It was, I marveled at the skill set. Flutie and Tomlinson had a strong connection early on, but the teammate and mentor that impacted Tomlinson the most that would be the last Chargers player selected with the fifth overall pick in the NFL draft, Junior Seau. Fellow linebacker Donnie Edwards recalls the tone Seau's intensity set. The competition, I mean, because Junior is one of those guys who, I mean, doesn't matter if it's practice or the game, this guy's going to get, he's given it all. And you better watch out because he will knock <laughs> out of you. Well, I think it was a natural evolution of a friendship uh, being built. You know, the first thing that happens, uh, you know, I come into a locker room, obviously, with a superstar, uh, all-world player like Junior Seah, and I'm the rookie, the first-round draft pick, and naturally, he's going to welcome me to the team, but also welcome me to the NFL. And and he did that in practice. You know, the very first practice, you know, he pretty much ran me over, you know, put me on my butt, and, and you know, made me do it again. I had to do the exact same play, go back and block Junior again as he's screaming 100 miles an hour coming at me, you know, trying to run me over. But it was that initial, I, I guess, um, that initial impact, that initial um, welcome to the NFL moment that allowed me to, to go, I guess, talk to Junior and feel like, you know what? This guy is trying to help me in a way, even though it didn't seem like it initially, he's trying to help me because, you know, Junior was always the same way. He was always in the same place after practice, in the cold tub right away. And so he always left that time open to come talk to him. And sure enough, you know, I started to ease my way into the cold tub right after practice because Junior was in there. And that's when we start to have those conversations about what it took to play at this level, at the NFL level. NFL Network's Jim Trotter wrote an entire book on Seau. The former Chargers beat writer recalls the specific way the linebacker would take young athletes like Tomlinson under his wing. One thing you have to understand about Junior is that he was willing to help any teammate as long as that teammate was receptive to that help. And the one thing about Junior is he was not going to seek you out and say, let me mentor you. He wanted the young guys to sort of come to him and ask for that help because to him that showed that they were serious about it. And so with LT, excuse me, um, Junior knew that there was a special talent there and this, and I almost said kid, that's how old I am when I think about LT. Um, there was there was this sense of humility about LT and this, this desire to be great 
And I'll never forget Junior told me one practice, uh, they were doing seven on seven. And LT runs a particular route and Junior and the defense, they cover it really well. And LT comes to him and says, why did you do that? What did you see? You know, those sorts of things. So he was constantly picking his brain. And that told Junior that this was someone who wanted to learn, who was willing to put in the work and wanted to learn. And then beyond that, the things like the rookie dinner, and I'll never forget the rookie dinner, Chris. Um, you know, Junior sits down with everyone. Everybody's crowded around the table. I'm next to Junior. And he says, all right, guys, tonight, everything is on the rookie. So don't order just one. If you order in the filet mignon, just order two of them. Like it doesn't matter, it's on him tonight. And I'll tell you, Chris, they did. They ordered two and three of everything. And so they're yucking it up, laughing. And I'm sitting there thinking like, man, this is gonna be the most money I've ever spent in one night. And to Junior's credit, he let all the, he let everything come in. You know, the money, they gave me the bill. And secretly, Junior was asking all the guys for cash for a tip. And he gathered all that money and he gave it to me. And he said, I know you got to pay this bill, but but here's a little extra. This is what the guys have put on it. And you know, that, that was, that was, he didn't have to do that, you know, but that was Junior. Yep, he was introducing me to what it meant to play on the team, but at the same time, we're gonna pull our weight. We're gonna we're gonna do our part as well, and that relationship just continued to build from there. The 1990s All-Decade linebacker left a clear impression on the first-year player. It would shape the way Tomlinson treated rookies that looked up to him. Linebacker Sean Merriman and offensive tackle Marcus McNeil can tell you firsthand. Junior say I was one to implement the, uh, the the rookie dinner, and it kind of kept the tradition. Um, and, you know, I remember coming in there and they was, I was supposed to take out the whole team. I think if you were four years uh, and up, you were invited to the rookie dinner. And I just remember uh, Low Neal and all the guys and just Drew Brees having a good time, eating, drinking, and just doing whatever they wanted to do. Um, and then me getting a bill, that, that large $32,000 bill that I received at the end of the night. Um, but one thing I always remember is when LT, um, he st basically he stood up on a chair and said, hey guys, look, we're gonna need this. We're gonna need this dude. Um, he's gonna have to come in and play for us uh, and make an impact early on. And that kind of softened the cushion, believe it or not, a little bit at the time. It was like, um, if, if LT looked at me that way, then I had to come in and perform. Um, you know, obviously he was a, a, such a staple on that team. Um, and you didn't hear LT speak a lot. He didn't, he didn't talk a whole lot, but when he did, you could hear pin drop. And so that was just a level of respect um, that I think that everyone had, including myself, for L. That was probably one of the, one of the biggest bills I've seen. <laughs> About 30K. But you know what? That's when I knew LT was a stand-up guy because he actually chipped in. I think he put a couple grand down for it, too, you know. So me and Cromarty didn't have to split the whole bill. So I knew he was a stand-up guy right then. Tomlinson finished his rookie campaign with over 1,600 all-purpose yards and 10 scores. But it wasn't perfect. Ball security was an issue. He uncharacteristically put the ball on the ground eight times that season. But as LA Times writer Sam Farmer recalls, LT's most expensive fumble came in week two. Yeah, as a rookie, he, he uh, playing the Cowboys, I believe, he lost two diamond earrings uh, <laughs> at 1.6 carats. And you'd think those are big enough to find. I mean, you could probably find those from the upper deck. Um, but he had to sift through the grass and, and find those diamond earrings, which he had lost uh, as a rookie. But that really sort of belied who he was because he, again, he was a superstar and yet didn't have the superstar attitude. He was very accessible. He was the easiest guy. You'd have thought he was the third string running back uh, with how good he was to deal with as a reporter. You go up to his locker at any time and he'd give you a great answer. And he was hanging around the locker room. A lot of times those guys, they'll disappear from the locker room. You'll never, never see them. But Ladanian was always around, was always accessible, and was always really good to talk to. I mean, it's incredible because I was able to play against LT his rookie year. I mean, I want to say that was 2001, right? 2001, yeah. Drew Brees, 
was also a rookie that year. And uh, I remember both of those young guys. And I remember uh, LT specifically because I had to chase him around the field and try to tackle him as much as I can. And uh, from, from day one, you knew this guy was going to be something special for the NFL. After playing two games against Tomlinson in 2001, rival Chiefs linebacker Donnie Edwards no longer had to chase the elusive rookie around the field. It just so happened the following offseason, Edwards' former coach in Kansas City, he was out of a job in Washington and looking to sunny Southern California as his next destination. Coming from uh, the 2000, uh, 2000 season, 2001 season, before Marty came, I mean, the Chargers weren't playing well at all. And uh, Marty came from a very uh, um, uh, substantial career with the Chiefs, winning playoffs, the whole deal. And he was an old school uh, players coach. Uh, per se, but he definitely, uh, you know, he, he was a, he was a tough coach and it was very different. I know I remember in 02 um, when we had training camp at UCSD, um, you know, we had two and a half hour practices back to back with pads. I mean, now it's, it sounds uh, unheard of now, especially in today's game, but that's the way it was two and a half hours, Marty ball. I mean, we had Oklahoma drill. We had one-on-one pass rush um we had a uh, lead drill with fullbacks i mean you have a linebacker and you have a fullback running full speed into each other just to make sure that we know how to fit i mean these kind of things were just uh, unheard of i guess uh for the Chargers at that time but for me coming from kansas city with marty starting back in 96 i mean i understood like this is how you make teams tough and marty certainly brought that 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 attitude and that uh toughness to the team. Trotter, Farmer, and Chargers president of football operations John Spanos all remember the way Schottenheimer impacted a ball club that had struggled to find victories in previous years. I'm a firm believer, like it drives me nuts when we in the media talk about young players very quickly or very early in their career and call them busts. And we fail to look at the context of which the situation that that player was placed into, like with a quarterback. You may have a quarterback who, who has a certain skill set, but you have a coach who says, no, I run a different system. And even though my system doesn't fit your skill set, you're going to run it. That quarterback fails. And we say the quarterback was a bust. With LT, I think one of the best things that happened for LT was playing for Marty Schottenheimer because Marty Schottenheimer was committed to the run game and everybody knew it. And it created a culture internally about we are going to run it. Marty had this infectious energy and a, a uh, it was a little corny. I mean, it felt like uh, a little rah-rah or sort of from a, uh, a forgotten era. Uh, and you wondered how he would connect to guys, but he did. He had an amazing ability to connect with guys and the, the energy of that team and his speeches and about grabbing the brass ring and, and Marty, um, uh, did inject uh, an energy into this franchise. You know, he had a, a particular brand of football, which was we're going to be able to run the ball. We're going to control the clock. We're not going to turn it over. And he had a formula that lent itself to winning games. And obviously a big part of the formula and a big part of running the ball is having a special running back, right? And so that, that's why I think partly why it was such a great pairing. Hey everybody, Lazy Dog Restaurants is spreading holiday cheer with these fun DIY gingerbread house kits to take home. It's fun because they partnered with Habitat for Humanity. 100% of the net proceeds from gingerbread houses sold will build homes in our community. The kits come with everything you need, from icing to gumdrops and other candies to build the best looking house. I can't wait to make mine with my family and friends. You can see what it's all about at LazyDogRestaurants.com. It didn't take long for Marty Ball to have an impact on Tomlinson's game. LT was very good his rookie year, right? Um, but make no mistake about it. Like, I really believe every single rookie, okay, and I don't care, like, where you came from, what college you played at, like, where you were drafted, it's an adjustment. It is. And it's going to take a little time for you. No one comes in as, like, their best self, right? So LT has this rookie year that's very good. Okay, don't get me wrong. But if you look at, like, the jump he made, from year one to year two, it's very noticeable, right? So in year two, okay, the 2002 year, there's a couple of games that really stand out. Earlier in, early in the year, we're playing the New England Patriots at home, okay? And these are the Patriots that just won the Super Bowl the year before, and LT just goes off, right? It was one of those games, especially where I just felt like 
just give him the ball because something special is going to happen. He rips off two long touchdowns. The second one was ended up being the, the deciding touchdown, the game winner essentially, was a long run. One of my favorite plays all time, we had a receiver, Tim Dwight, who comes sprinting down the sideline, like out of nowhere, and makes one of the greatest like hustle plays to make the final block that springs LT into the end zone. And I mean, it's it's like one of my favorite plays and it was such a big game for us because we just beat the defending world champions. And that that really kind of was a, a statement game for LT. Um, and that was in his second year. And the one that stands out to me is, is just one particular play. It was actually in Qualcomm Stadium and they were playing the Patriots. And LT made a move, he came through the hole um, over the, the right guard and he came through and Teddy Teddy Bruschi was waiting on him. And LT almost stopped on a dime and like back hopped to where Teddy reached and couldn't get him. And then he went forward from that through any potential tackle. And I'll never forget, I was sitting there with Nick Canepa and some other folks and we both kind of looked at each other like, that may be the best five yard run I've ever seen. I mean, it was just, it was just incredible. You know, the, the athleticism and the ability to, to stop and start, the suddenness about it. And we saw that so many times with him that um, there were moments where you almost took it for granted. But, but, you know, early on when we saw it, we were like, oh man, you know, I can speak for myself as a beat writer. I had not seen that from a running back in person before. I just remember it, it was it was a weird game because we were losing at first um, and we started to come back and it it actually started on a long run that I had. And I remember Tim Dwight being out in front blocking, you know, he was blocking for me. And um, we, we ran the ball pretty well that day. And I, and I gotta say, I remember because after the game, Charlie Weiss, who was with the Patriots, you know, he you know he always said that they were going to draft me, you know, if the Chargers wouldn't have drafted me that year. And I just remember after the game, he was like, "We should have had you." <laughs> so. Also, in that year, O2, later in the year, we're playing the Broncos at home, a game that goes into overtime and LT is just like a one man wrecking crew. I mean, he goes for like over 220 yards, um, you know, adds more through the air. And it was it, it was games like that, his second year where you're like, wow, like we got something really special. I was tired. I was tired after that game, um, but it was a huge game as we started to believe that we were superior in our division, that we can compete and that we were gonna be a team uh, that that would be uh, vying for division champs for years to come. I, I think that was the moment where we really felt like that. Uh, but man, that was a tough fall game. And I, I just remember being exhausted after that game. And then the next year, 03, he averages 100 yards a game rushing, right? Has over 1600 yards and still had 100 receptions. So you talk about like offensive production and then it only even got better from there. So I would say it was very early on. We knew we had someone incredibly special. In Tomlinson's rookie year, he caught more passes than he did his entire four seasons at TCU. In his first year under Schottenheimer, he caught 20 more than that. By 2003, Tomlinson was fourth in the NFL with 100 catches, just one behind Arizona's Anquan Bolden. For rookie tight end Antonio Gates, now the all-time receptions leader for the Chargers, seeing a running back put up those kind of receiving numbers was astonishing. It's never been, in my opinion, again, uh, a guy that can do both um, uh, in terms of in the run game, in the pass game. I mean, you can just do so much with the guy. Uh, you know, we ran certain, you know, H posts with him. We, we can, you, can, you can spread him out and you can run a slant. Uh, you can use him, you know, he was like a chess piece. You can kind of use him in different ways. But more importantly, when it, when the time came, it was time to run the football, uh, he was just unstoppable. And uh, that's something that we emphasized, the, the physicality of the football team was about running the football. And um, he was the cornerstone of that. While dual threat running backs are much more commonplace now, Trotter and Gates remember just how unheard of this was back in 2003 especially for a player who averaged just 10 catches per season in college. And so there were folks who didn't know if he had that element in his game. 
And what we quickly learned is he was one of those guys you could go put in the slot if you wanted, and he can be an extra receiver. He was he was that good in the passing game. Um, and so for him to go 100, you know, with 100 receptions, it didn't surprise me at all. I think that was that was a part of my game that I always had, um, to be quite honest. I was always very, you know, good at catching the ball uh, from a young age. But I think, you know, learning how to run routes is something that I was raw, you know, coming into the league. But there was one guy that helped me, the, you know, not, I, wouldn't, I shouldn't say one guy. There was a couple of guys that I got to give credit uh, that helped me the most. Terrell Davis, I'm sorry, Terrell Fletcher first. You know, my rookie year, Terrell Fletcher was an outstanding third down back. And he was really good at running those angle routes and post routes and option routes. And so I really learned how to start to run routes from Terrell Fletcher. He was a great teacher. Um, and, I, I, you know, I learned a, a lot from him. And then the other guy was, was Marshall Falk. You know, I was fortunate to get to know Marshall uh, because he lived in San Diego. And we kind of ran in the same circle. So we started to play golf uh, with one another. And I would, I would rely on Marshall. I would ask him so many questions about running routes. Um, and he, he was more than happy to share. And so that was the reason why I was able um, to take my game to another level and catch the football. The other thing is, honestly, Chris, I was, I was it, buddy. I mean, we didn't have much at that time in 2003. I mean, they had to throw the football to me and, and hand it to me as well. So that was just, I was just doing my duty. I mean, if you was a come to a game at that time, <laughs> in that era, I mean, it, it'll it sound like this. LaDainian Thomas is on a carry. LaDainian Thomas is on a catch. LaDainian Thomas is on an incomplete pass. I mean, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, he meant so much to what we were doing. Uh, I just knew that he was uh, someone we trusted, uh, that, you know, as a whole. Like, our team, we trusted that he would be able to carry the load, uh, whether or not we had to run the ball 40, 30, 40 times whether or not we had to throw it to him out the backfield. Uh, uh, whatever we had to do, we had to make sure he found ways to touch the football because that gave us the best opportunity to win the game. Flutie started at quarterback a few games that year, including a late season win over Detroit, where LT had nearly 150 yards receiving and nine catches on top of 25 carries. We were well over 200 yards in the first half. And two of the plays were... F what we call F post, just an angle route by LT out of the backfield, stick a straight in the route, boom, five yard completion, splits two guys, outruns the safety, goes 60 yards for a touchdown, did it again later first. He had two of those in the first half of that game. And it's like a little five yard completion for the quarterback. And that's the stuff that, that you know, made him so dangerous and versatile. And, and in the NFL, you win with matchups. And so what, when you have a running back that can run routes, you can get him on linebackers and get a mismatch. When you have tight ends that can get in line and block or motion of the backfield, be a fullback, but could still, like a Gronk, bounce out there and get a matchup now, you make teams go regular personnel and you get these matchups with your tight ends and your tailbacks. And you run option routes with these guys. And, you know, LT was just, his work ethic, everything. It just, it was so much fun to play with LT. And as Tomlinson's touches increased, the bond between him and Schottenheimer continued to grow. You know, LT would have dinners at his house sometimes. LT and Latorsha would have dinner at his house sometimes. And, and it's that kind of culture, that kind of environment that makes players feel like they are valued as opposed to I'm the head coach, you're the player, you're going to do what I say and that's it. And, and, and there isn't a connection. And we see that in the NFL, unfortunately, at times. You didn't see that with Marty's teams. Um, he made these guys feel like they were in it together. And one of the most effective ways that Marty brought his Chargers teams together was uniting them against someone else. I was going to bring that up because that's a very real thing. Okay, like Marty's dislike for the Raiders, a very real thing. Obviously, he spent a lot of time with the Chiefs and then he came here. And um, I mean, you knew in the building when it was Raider week, you knew when it was Raider week. And, and again, like the team felt that. And I don't think it's just a coincidence. Think about this, Haley. We, we beat the Raiders 13 games in a row. Okay, like, do you know how hard that is to do in the NFL against a division rival? And that doesn't happen without Marty instilling the Raider Week mantra. 
okay, in this team. Um, and and it, and I don't know. I don't think it's a coincidence that some of LT's best games came against the Raiders. I mean, he got up for that game, no doubt. He got up for every game, okay. But um, Raider Week was definitely um, you knew you knew when it was Raider Week. Marty hated the Raiders more than any other team, and he was not afraid to 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 to, to show that. And he would tell his players that, and they adopted that same attitude. They loved going up into the Coliseum. Yeah, obviously the 2002 game in Oakland in overtime. You know, I, I, I still I still think in our sport, I'm not sure there's a more exciting play than a touchdown in overtime that ends the game. I just think it's one of the most exciting plays in our game. And, and we've been able to experience it a number of times. Um, obviously in the playoffs, Sproles did it against the Colts, right? But LT was like, he was the man when it came to that situation. And the 0-2 Oakland game is a perfect example. We're in overtime in the black hole. And what made it even sweeter was the touchdown that he scored was in the end zone where the black hole nation sets up. And they'll send Peel in motion. First and 10 at the Raider, 19 yard line. Give to LT, big hole left side. He's gone, he's gone. Touchdown, the Danian Tomlinson. And the ball game is over. And I'll never forget the one time LT scores the winning touchdown. And he slides on both knees and he's got his hands outstretched, you know, like, like he's on the cross. And they're just showering him with popcorn, with soda, beer, whatever you say. And it's right in front of the black hole. And for LT, and I'm gonna assume here, knowing the way that I do, that was the greatest show of respect that Raiders fans could have given him, giving him that treatment. They loved beating the Raiders. It started with Marty. He instilled that in them. And even after Marty was gone, they continued that, you know, um, for them, there was nothing like beating the Raiders. As Schottenheimer continued to sculpt a hard-nosed team in his image, Trotter recalls how Tomlinson took the leap from star to superstar. And then later as it went on, what you realize that his football IQ was so high that the game slowed for him. He was like playing at a different speed. Like it looked like he was relaxed and, and moving without effort, but it was only because his mind was so far ahead of the defense in terms of what it was trying to accomplish that as Marcus Allen used to say, when I'm making a move, I'm not looking at the guy in front of me. I'm already by him. I'm looking at the guy behind him. And that was kind of the way LT was as well. The game has slowed so much for him that he was a step ahead of the defense. And that development went hand in hand with Tomlinson's evolving appreciation of the Marty Ball offense. Yeah, so the funny thing is, I initially didn't like Marty's favorite play, power. I didn't like it. Because, you know, I felt like I was running up the middle all the time. And I remember my mom used to always tell, she used to always ask me when I first got with, with Marty, when Marty first got there my second year, around my third year, my mom kept asking me, why does he always run you up the middle? <laughs> so I had to explain to her, that's his favorite play. The play is called power and you got to run it up the middle. And she used to shake her head like, I think he does it too much. And, and so initially, I didn't like the, the play because I felt like I was running up the middle a lot. And when you think about it, Chris, I came from a style at TCU where we ran on the perimeter a lot. So I, I really had to adjust my game to running inside more. But my favorite plays, my favorite plays were, you know, the counter plays where you start one direction and you go back the other direction. I love the toss plays where I can get out on the perimeter. Um, you know, those were my favorite plays. I got to say power probably didn't become one of my favorite plays until, you know, later in my career. And in 2005, a physical touchdown burst right up the gut against the Patriots would end up being the NFL run Tomlinson is most proud of. He picked up eight. So second and two. It's back to L. Touchdown. You know, I heard running backs say this before that oftentimes, you know, your favorite run is just, you know, a, a short run, you know, um, it's usually not the long runs. And here's why. Usually on the long runs, it was great blocking. Everybody did everything they were supposed to do 
you know, you did your job, play work just like you drew it up. On the hard runs, you have to make sometimes things happen. You know, you have to make somebody miss. You have to run over somebody. You have to show a certain level of determination um, and grit to get to where you need to go. And on that eight-yard run against the Patriots, I, I, I believe I displayed everything that, that a running back should. I made somebody miss initially as soon as I got the ball. I broke a tackle to get through the hole. Once I got through the hole, about four or five yards from the end zone, I was contacted. And the determination and grit, the drive of dragging a man five yards into the end zone, I mean, that, that, that it, you know, I surprised myself, Chris. I got to be honest with you at that, at that time. Later that same 2005 season, LT had yet another iconic run. This one, a walk-off overtime touchdown in our nation's capital. It was a moment that John Spanos and former Chargers guard Mike Goff remember well. Um, and then he had another walk-off. Um, actually, we're playing Washington in D.C. in overtime. And, you know, one of his icons and, and a guy he really respected was safety Sean Taylor. He was an incredible player. And, um, you know, it was kind of a great head-to-head -head matchup. And in overtime, he got the ball and was able to get past Sean and score a touchdown to win the game. I do remember that game because it, we, we, we flew across the country and that's always difficult. You've been on those trips and then you, we got off to a slow start. And I think that the great thing about that team and just that the five years I was here, was there was never any need for panic. And you just, we, we all we all knew it. We all knew what was happening, but we all knew that we would just had to continue to stay the path. We knew that if we just were able to get our job, if we got our job done up front, that man could make anything happen. And so I think when you get a chance to just realize that, hey, this isn't good enough, you either do one of two things. You either accept it being not good enough or you do something about it. And we came out in the second half and, and I'll never forget that, that game when he touched down. We had, we had 50 power called, pulled around the corner. I, I, I hit one of the safeties. I saw, I saw him run. I'm like, awesome. Let's go home. I'm tired. First overtime possession, LaDainian Tomlinson. He sneaks by Washington, breaks it free, and the San Diego Chargers have won in overtime. A 41-yard touchdown run. How about that? A place where Schottenheimer was fired in the 2001 season is a place where he is victorious in 2005. It was a moment that was burned into the memory of former Washington safety Ryan Clark. So we're in cover four, that means I have quarters and LaDainian gets the football, he breaks it up the middle. And I'm a pretty good tackler. You know, at the time I, was, I wasn't the biggest guy at the time, I was like 185, 190, but that was my thing. I got people to the ground. So here it is, I'm, I'm squeezing LaDainian's hip, I'm doing everything right, everything like I've been taught. I'm expecting the other safety to be coming to sandwich him with me, and he's not there. So I'm by myself, but all is well. Open field tackle, I've been playing football since I was four years old. I understand it. And Ladanian's kind of running away from me, so I leave my feet to get him. And normally, you leave your feet, you grab a guy, you get him to the ground. Bro, Ladanian stiff arms me. And I swear, it was like one of those cartoons or one of those graphics where the dude gets stiff-armed and he ends up going through the ground. Like, that's what I felt like. I felt like he stiff-armed me through the freaking grass, man. And, and, you know, they tell you hop up like the ground's on fire. So I hop up, man. He ends up scoring a touchdown. And I just remember him celebrating. And it's like, I remember, it's overtime. And so I chase him to the end zone and I just run straight in the locker room. I don't stop. I don't pass go. I don't collect $200, nothing. And it was just, to me, man, like, it just really was an example of who this dude was, that normally those plays don't happen in overtime. Normally, you know, it's about the quarterback, it's about the wide receivers, but a dude like him could get you 60 yards like that, right? Could get you a touchdown like that. And when you're so good, man, that you have walk-off runs, right? The, like, like a Michael Jordan shot, like a Kobe Bryant shot, you know, that's why that dude has a gold jacket, and that's truly why he's one of the greatest running backs uh, to have ever played the game. And it was the late Sean Taylor that brought the best out of Tomlinson that day. I remember just the back and forth, the competitiveness that Sean and I were going back and forth. And then after the game, to embrace um, the way we did, 
um, the mutual respect that I, I think we both were, were trying to gain from one another throughout that game because obviously it was our first time facing one another. Uh, but but to have that mutual respect after the game, after the game, um, that's what I remember the most. You know, it, it, you know that was an incredible game, one of the hardest but most gratifying games that I played in. For Gates and John Spanos, the walk-off score was yet another example of just how special Tomlinson was to the Chargers offense. He had so many of those, so it wasn't, I mean, he don't have a, like a true moment that sticks out because he had so many moments in my mind and he, had, he got so many memories uh, with me and with the organization where uh, it's very hard to try to start pinpointing things out on the road. But I do remember that game. I do remember him, you know, selling the game with a long run for us to win against Washington. Like every time he touched the ball, you felt like something special could happen, you know? And when 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 you watch games, you know, like I sit upstairs and watch every game, right? And, I, you know, I have my, my, you know, Chargers employee hat on, I have my fan hat on. You know, sometimes as a game is unfolding, you might have like some opinions about what kind of play, you know, do we want to run? Do we want to pass here? What are we going to do? When we had LaDainian Tomlinson on our team, I was good with the LaDainian Tomlinson run on 100% of the plays because I knew anytime he touched it, he might score. Hey everybody, Lazy Dog Restaurants is spreading holiday cheer with these fun DIY gingerbread house kits to take home. It's fun because they partnered with Habitat for Humanity. 100% of the net proceeds from gingerbread houses sold will build homes in our community. The kits come with everything you need, from icing to gumdrops and other candies to build the best looking house. I can't wait to make mine with my family and friends. You can see what it's all about at LazyDogRestaurants.com. In 2005, victories over New England and Washington wouldn't be enough for the team to make the postseason. The Chargers would miss the playoffs at 9-7. and seven. But that's not what stands out to Edwards about the end of that season. What he remembers is the message Marty had for his team. I'll never forget this. He's like, <laughs> he's like, I don't want the best players. I want the best people. And I'm sitting in the back of the meeting like, what the hell is this guy talking about? I want the best players. Like, give me the... Yeah, give me the best three technique, you know, in front of me. We need some DBs. But, you know, as I got older, I started to realize, and I really had an opportunity to talk to him after. I said, you know what, Coach, I think I was a little too young to really comprehend exactly what you were uh, um, meaning when you were talking in, you know, the team meeting. And uh, you want good quality people that buy into the system, that, 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 that want to win. Considering how the Chargers performed the following year in 06, Schottenheimer may have been on to something. For Merriman and Gates, it was always about more than just football to Marty. In 2005, my rookie year, uh, you know, I had that big hit against Kansas City, against Priest Holmes. And, uh, you know, he was out. He was he was out. And you know, it was a big hit, big collision. And I got up and I was celebrating and I was kind of just caught in the moment, moment. My adrenaline was rushing. And I remember running over to the sideline because we had to go to commercial break. Priest Holmes was still down. Um, and as I'm celebrating, I'm excited. Marty Schottenheimer comes and he grabs me by the face mask. He says, hey, great hit. But don't forget that this guy's family and his friends, relatives are watching. And at that moment, um, it, I came down and I realized that he's right. Um, you know, it's a big hit, great play. But, you know, it was a, a human aspect to it. And that was just Marty. Marty Schottenheimer, man. He, um, like I said, he, he, he instilled a lot of, things that uh, goes far beyond the football field um, and you know that's why I always miss him. Oh man, he was a, a one of the, the best motivators I've ever been around and um, he um, emphasized toughness to our team. He emphasized playing for one another, uh, holding each other accountable. Um, he was you know a big part of me in terms of my growth as a football player. So, uh, you know, he, he's very special to me. Uh, he's always, he's always and always will be very special to me because of, uh, he was my first coach. So uh, I can just um, remember the times of uh, how he would always call us out because he wanted us to be accountable for everything that we did, which internally made us a better football team because we grew as people, we grew as football players. So. Uh, He's very special to me. Marty Schottenheimer understood that if he wanted to rebuild the Chargers, 
he needed his players to buy in. His goal was to create an atmosphere of hard-nosed players committed to the singular goal of winning by forcing their opponent to submit. As Trotter realized during his time covering the Bolts, that kind of coaching mentality is one that could have only come from a certain kind of former player. And he was not a star player. Um, Marty would tell you he was kind of a grunt. He didn't have great speed. He didn't have great athleticism. He kind of had to work for what he got. Secondly, I think the thing that related was he created a family atmosphere. His wife, Pat, was sort of the matriarch. Wherever Marty went, there was a, there was a family atmosphere where you have Marty who was a patriarch and his wife was a matriarch. And they created this environment where um, it felt like family for the players. Lastly, I would say Marty was, as he liked to say or consider himself, he was a great communicator. And that rubbed some people the wrong way. But I think he did like to draw very bright lines um, with his players, with the media, with whomever. And he would tell you what he expected from you. And anyone who knows Marty knows how emotional he was. And so he wasn't afraid to shed a tear, you know, whether it was in front of his, his players or in front of the media in certain situations. And I think they felt that he cared. You know, sometimes I guess things align in, in you know, the football guys, if you will, you know, they, they shine on you at times. And I, I tell you, for me to have someone that believed in me, to give me the opportunity to put the ball in my belly as much as he did, um, you know, that's all you can ask for, is for a coach to believe in you, to give you every opportunity possible, um, you know, so that you can help win games for your team. This has been an LA Chargers production. Coming up next on Running for History, before we explore Tomlinson's record-breaking 2006 MVP season, we have to take a look at the guys up front who made it all possible. Like, you, you, you think about blue-collar guys that get up in the morning early, you know, before the crack of dawn. They pack their lunch. In fact, they already have their lunch packed at night. You know, so when they get up in the morning, they just gonna grab that joker and they're off to work. And as and, and soon as they get out their car, they put that hard hat on because they know it's time to go to work. Man, they are, to me, they are the reason that things happen for myself, for a guy like LaDainian, for a guy like Philip, for a guy like, I mean, those are true warriors um, to me. I love pulling because, man, it's gonna hurt. When you go run around there full speed and you run into some big girl over on the other side, it's gonna hurt. Is it gonna hurt me? Or is it going to hurt you? And who's it going to hurt more? So I wanted to make, I want to inflict as much pain on you. It might not always start pretty. And sometimes people are going to have a good game plan, but you weren't going to abandon it. You were going to keep grinding. You were going to keep chopping. You were going to keep doing everything that you had to do to go win, to go win the game. And you were going to do it running the ball. And I think that was a, that was just such a, you take pride in it as an offensive line. And when your running back has, over 150 yards at the game, you kind of grab a grab a cold beer after the game and you say, hey, all right, we got the job done this week. It's on to the next. That's how I characterize those guys. Never wanted the credit, but you can depend on them. And they were the guys that were my bodyguards, leading me through, lead me wherever I needed to go. And I always knew that they would show up. I always knew they would. If you want to see more content like this, check out the link right here.